I'll just give everybody a second to sit down and get ready. Okay, great. Welcome to Intermediate 6502, where I'll hopefully improve your design and analysis for solving problems in 6502. I'm going to write all the code in N6502, but if there is a counter or interesting alternative offered by 65C02 or 4510, then I will mention it as an aside. The first project, or contrivance, I'm going to show is a windowing system. I'll just give a quick demo of the final product. So we have a very empty screen with a menu up the top. I press a key and the menu becomes active. Now I can move left and right, and up and down. You may also notice it's not as clear as I had hoped. There are underscores on some of the letters. This allows me to jump to the selection by pressing said key. We can open a test dialog. Here you can see a label. I have a number editor which is currently highlighted and a large OK button, which when I select, exits the dialog and goes back to the empty screen. I have another dialog on the next menu, which is just an OK button, which then opens another one. If I select no, it will return to the previous dialog again, and if I select it again, and this time choose yes, they will both go away. And this is all it does. But there are a lot of techniques behind this, and adding more dialogues and widgets is fast and easy at this point. Those are not the lesson though. Now this is a fixed windowing system, and by fixed I mean every single piece of text, menu, list, widget, dialog box, value, button, string, etc. is known at assemble time. I.e. I hit assemble, and the assembler can inspect and pack every bit of data it needs to. Nothing is loaded or added by a user post-assembly. This is not generic or dynamic as GEOS is, but more designed for a sprite editor, map editor, music editor, word processor, or spreadsheet application at all. Or a game such as Pirates or Ultima, where the UI is fixed, finite, and designed by the developer. Course prerequisites. I expect you to know all of the 6502 opcodes. I'm not going to explain how they work unless I'm doing something that is a little complicated or something that is not on the label. For example, I will explain my use of dot byte dollars to C, which just happens to be bit abs, and how I use it to step over two bytes. Things of this nature will be explained and highlighted. Also, addressing modes. I am not going to explain how index, indirect, etc. works. I assume you know and understand how they all work. Working knowledge of your host machine. I am not going to discuss how I draw anything. I assume writing code to draw a button or window, etc. is trivial for you and not something I need to cover. This is also because each machine will have its own needs, text-based or bitmap-based, etc. For the record, I'm drawing mine with Petsky and kernel calls on the Commodore 128 using the 80 column VDC chip. This is because the 128's kernel and the VDC chip make my life easier and save me from having to write a pile of code to make this demonstration. That being said, there are points where I will need to talk and demonstrate how I draw and set up things as it will be part of the lesson on how to do this or that. For the most part, I will leave it as simply draw button. Things this course is not. This is not a paint by numbers course, in that if you copy and paste all the little snippets I give you, you won't get a functioning windowing system. As this is A, very bare bones, B, for the Commodore 1 to AVDC, and C, a huge contrivance where I will solve problems three different ways in the code to explain and compare the techniques, making it a bit of a mess. Take the theory, take the technique, don't take the code. I am generally assuming you are on a RAM rich design, such as the Commodore 64, 128, Apple IIe or older, Atari 800, Commander X16, but at points where the decision is impacted by RAM or ROM or RAM constrained conditions, I will mention it as a consideration for the NES, BBCA, or Atari 400, etc. Tools. For this course, I will be using and demonstrating 64TAS, 
It is the best in-class assembler and has a lot of features that make this much easier to do. You can do everything I do in 64 tasks and anything else, just you will have to manually roll the data statements or use another method, perhaps a Python preprocessor script or a custom tool that makes designs and data. If this was 1986 and I just had Turbo Assembler or Merlin or PDS even, then I would have made a basic designer to make a sequential file for me. Another benefit of 64 TAS is that it supports the Commodore PRG format as used by the Commodore range and the upcoming Commander X16, the XEX Atari 8-bit format, and it can make an Apple II DOS 3.3 executable file. You can easily make it support others with custom headers and raw binary output such as a Nintendo Entertainment System or BBC Micro. That's the preamble done, on to the lesson. Lesson 1. Passing parameters, or not. When I draw a string, such as the menu string at the top of the screen, I need to tell the kernel the window I will allow or restrict its drawing to. This is called scissoring in modern graphics terms. So I need to pass a top, a bottom, a left, a right param to a function. Set up a window for me. But we only have three registers. Four things. Three registers. Four things. Three registers. One. Stash in memory locations and core. If this did a lot of processing of the data, it might be fair. But it stores the four values into four zero page memory locations. It would be faster, smaller, and wiser to just store them directly in the memory locations with a macro. You could also combine this with pass in register, load one into a param variable and then the other three in registers, but it's not much better. Also, with regards to this text, sadly YouTube Analytics doesn't tell me what resolution people watch the video in, which makes it hard to judge how much text I can put on the screen. Do I do 80 by 25 or 80 by 50, for example? If you're on 1080p, give this video a thumbs up. 480p, thumbs down. And if you're a 360p person, then I guess comment or like a comment about it. Or if you find this too much text or too little text, let me know in a comment so I can improve in future lessons. Two, make two functions. So I could do set top bottom and set left right. This way we only need to pass two params to each. Not really worth it to be honest. Not going to save that much in the end. You could also make it one function call and use the C flag to detect if you want to set TB or LR. Adds to the calling setup, but keeps the API cleaner. Still stupid for this use case. Maybe I can get the data to use less bytes. Well the left and right are 0 to 79. So that only needs 7 bits, and the top and bottom is 0 to 24, which only needs 5 bits. And two sevens are 14, and two fives are 10, and 14 plus 10 equals 24 bits, which is 3 bytes. Huzzah! <laughs> this is stupid. The amount of time and bytes it would take to extract the values and set them. I would need to have probably over 100, I can't be bothered to do the maths, calls before I saved anything over just making a macro to load and store the four values in place. 4. Use the stack. This is worse than storing the fixed locations and not ideal on a 6502. I would probably have to spend an entire video on just how to pass by the stack. 5. The fabled store the data in line after the call technique. This is really easy. First, after the JSR call, you have to pull the return address off the stack, stash it into the vector in a zero page. From there, you can then read the bytes past the JSR call. Remember to add 1 to get the first byte. Then, when you are done, add the number of bytes to the base address, push it back on the stack, and then return to skip the data. Okay, let me run that past you again. We pull the low address, we pull the high, so now the vector points to the last byte of the JSR instruction. 
we index 1 to get the first byte of data. We read the byte. We store it. Next. We read, store, next, read, store, next, read, store. Now we have to add 4 to the original address. Then we have to push it back high, then low. And then we just return. So now you can see that we've returned back after the data to hit its RTS. Couple of warnings with this technique. Uh, make sure you don't call anything that trashes the vector from within this function or you will be lost at sea. This eats some clocks and it has a solid cons cost and a variable cost. I.e. each param is now read post indirect. If you have a lot of unique parameters to this function and you have enough of them to warrant the overhead, at some point this method will become an outwin. But each shared data can cost you the full amount. This can be avoided by calling a function with the shared data, which mitigates some of the data size cost but adds to the cycle cost. Another warning to systems with banking make sure when you call the target function, the calling location is still visible. If you are on a NES, for example, have to swap banks to make the call via trampoline, you could end up reading garbage instead. Likewise, we say a 1 to 8. Call from block 1 to block 0. Oh dear. Pass a pointer to the params. This is basically the same logically, only now you load the A and X registers with a pointer rather than reading them off the stack. So now we load, 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 we jump, and then we just store, and then it's basically as before. Only we don't have to adjust at the end. This is better if you share a lot of large data. Not so much in this case as loading of the pointer eats 4 bytes, and the total data is 4 bytes. But on a large data set with lots of shared use, this could help. You could combine these two so you pass the pointer after the function call, if you have a lot of calls to save memory on, but also have a lot of shared data. However, all of these are great, but not the method I'm going to use. Collate the data in an array. I can just put all the data in an array and then pass the starting index. Now if I want to set the same data somewhere else, I just load the same index and call it. There is a small optimization. Can you see it? Pause the video, give yourself a few moments or so to puzzle it out. For those of you who have solved it, well done, you have a keen eye for optimizations. It is you can pre-bake the INXs and save some clocks and bytes. For always unique entries, this is easy to automate in 64 TAS. For finding unique cases, you can do it mostly internally to TAS, but I found it to be a bit temperamental. Sorry, Sosie. So I made a custom Python preprocessor, which does it for me, called Emmet Lay. This way I can set the data I want, and it just gives me the index. If I ask it for it again, it'll give me the index of existing data. Now this only works up to 256 divided by size of data. So in this case, I would have 64 unique possibilities. More than ample, I would think, for even the most intense windowing layouts. But there is a slight change we can do to get all 256 options available. Rather than make an array, we can make a struct of arrays. So Windows data becomes, and the code then becomes. Now, for good code, I recommend you make a kconst lookup so you can reference and read it more clearly in your code, and writing and storing the sets vertically like this is not the best. Again, 64 task can help us. It can do the struct to array of struct conversion for us. Here is the actual code from the example. I hope you have learned something, and I hope you'll join me for the next part where I look at constructing the menu data and how I traverse and update the state.